Hi guys. Um, yeah, today I'm here to give a brief tutorial um, on a bit of an overview of the Python ecosystem for spatial analysis and spatial data, and ideally be able to produce a nice, good-looking map at the end. Um, now, I'm apologizing now if I seem a bit unprepared or this goes too quickly. Um, I kind of found out about this, what, three days ago? So <laughs> um, this is a bit of a rush job, but hopefully it'll be informative and I'm more than happy to ask, answer questions at the end. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna start with is the kind of, the key idea, the key quote that tells us what spatial analysis is all about. And the basic idea is that everything in some way is similar to everything else in the world, doesn't matter where you are, but if you're closer to something, you're more likely to be similar to that than you are if you're further away. If you look at, say, Darwin's finches in the Galapagos, the closer they were together, they were more the same species. As they got further away, the species diverged. Pretty similar, but not quite the same. And that quote's been around for a long time. And GIS, if you don't know what GIS is, it's Geographic Information Systems. GIS is everywhere. So I will hopefully be able to turn that. Great. So one of the things with GIS is it's a broad discipline that's been around since actually the 1970s. A lot of people don't know that. But it's been around, it was started in Canada, um, and then it moved very quickly into the United States for the Department of Defense. They started a computer mapping group. And it's really only grown from there. But the real resurgence of GIS into the public consciousness has come from Google Maps. Google Maps came out in about 2005, 2006. Before that, no one really cared about spatial data you know, if we're honest, doesn't matter where it's happening, it's somewhere else, not here, until we saw Google Maps, and then closely on Google Maps was heels, Google Earth. And one of the really nice things about Google Earth is you can look at the whole world, or you can zoom in and have a look at your own house from, you know, just on the street. So, why Python? Well, happily, Python is the primary scripting language for all of the major GIS uh, systems in the world. So it's the major scripting language of Esri ArcGIS, which is the largest, if you don't know it, um, GIS proprietary system in the world. It has about 42% of market share, which, if you know much about economics, would be something that Coke or McDonald's would kill for. So they do quite well. The other primary GIS that Python use, uh, that is used, uses Python as its primary scripting language is QGIS. QGIS now is the largest open source GIS system in the world. So if you haven't used QGIS before, I really recommend it. Go take a look, QGIS.org. It's a great piece of software, and it's built in Qt. All the Python extensions are available online. There's a simple download manager. It's brilliant. And it's used by so many more as well. So now, because Python has got such a large level of popularity, within the GIS community and within the sciences as a whole and within uh, engineering and IT and within everything else, um, more and more systems are actually building in their own Python APIs. So we have Grass GIS, which has its own proprietary scripting language, now has a Python API as of last year. We have um, Pitney Bowes, MapInfo, they've got MapBasic, but they're now also moving towards their own proprietary uh, Python API as well. So, you know, it's very quickly taking over the industry, which is great, because um, it means you need to learn it once, and then your skills are very transferable. One of the biggest flaws, though, unfortunately, is everything seems to be stuck in Python 2.7. Um, one day, things will migrate, but for now, not so much. So, a quick, brief introduction to spatial data. I'm not sure, can I have a hand here? Who does GIS? Who's played with GIS before? Right. Okay, everyone in the room. This is really easy. Um, so, <laughs> great, don't need to explain this. So, so there's a few basic spatial data types. You all know this, points, lines, polygons, um, and rasters, and then you can look at networks, and you can look at temporal data, and all sorts of other uh, weird and wonderful things. And then a feature, some kind of object, in a GIS sense, is a geometry of some sort with some attributes attached to it. Great, easy. We also have projections in GIS. So I'm not sure if you've seen this ever before. Um, this is actually a closer representation of how the Earth really looks in space than you would find with your nice globe. The globe 
is a nice approximation, but it's a bit of a lie. So is the, was it oblate spheroid, which is the squashed globe? The Earth actually looks more like a potato floating in space. So <laughs> what we actually have is a real problem in GIS is our computer screens, and in fact all the tools that we use are in two dimensions. You've seen a map, it's on a flat piece of paper. We need to get from this potato to a map. And what we can do is we use projection systems to do that. Now projections uh, have two components. Projections have a datum, which is the model of the sphere that best represents the surface of the oblate spheroid at any given point on the planet. And then we actually have the projection, which is, which is the transformation from the surface of that sphere to a two-dimensional space. Now what this is, you'll see the color scheme here. The color scheme is the difference in height of the Earth's surface from the spheroid at all these points. So red means that the Earth's surface is higher than the spheroid. Blue means that the Earth's surface is lower than the spheroid. So this is the GRS-80 spheroid. It's pretty common. It's used everywhere. Um, so it's a good idea to know what we talk about when we're talking about projections. Because we'll start with something like this. Latitude and longitude. This is a plate car projection. Uh, basically what this does is it sets latitude and longitude to equal in every direction. So we have our simple uh, x and y, and we can draw a bunch of circles on the map. It's really easy to do. It's called a Tissot index, which was done by a Frenchman many, many years ago. Um, and what this set of circles does is it shows us on the map when we change the projection from something like the plate car projection to the standard Mercator projection, this shows us the distortion as we move further away from the equator in this projection. Now this next projection here is a disconnected projection. Now it's important to know what we're looking at when we're looking at the properties of our projections because a projection is just a representation of our data in a two-dimensional space, which means that there are a few properties of projections that's worth knowing about. The first is that a projection can only preserve some features of your data. So it can only preserve some of the area, the shape, the direction, the distance, um, the bearing. You can't ever preserve them all because it's not a true representation of the world as a 3D sphere. Um, and this is worth knowing because it's important when we're looking at something like a map to know what purpose that map was designed for. This projection here is really nice for the sort of viewing the true shape of countries and the true area and the true size of countries as a whole, but it's worthless if you're trying to find the direction from point A to point B. The Mercator projection, which was invented in the 18, no, 1700s by a Frenchman, Mercator, um, is great if you're looking at sailing across an ocean because great lines are represented in the Mercator projection as a straight line, but everything else, not so much. You can see the further you get from the equator, the more distortion there is in the map. And then, I'm going to move on to what I'm going to try and achieve today. So our goal today is to make a map. Pretty obvious, this is GIS. Everyone loves looking at a map at the end. It's, you know, it's always fun. And the goal is to see if we have a data set containing the locations of a bunch of tweets, which I've you know, gathered over the last couple of days since I've been in the conference, in and around the conference center, can I make a map? Can I show that these tweets are on the map? And then can I show how or if these tweets are clustered? Can I do some basic spatial analysis? And can I do it in Python? Now hopefully this image will make a bit more sense as we go through, but for now, I'll leave it as it is. And the first thing we want to look at is the Fiona library. Now who here has used GDAL and or OGR? Everyone? Okay. For those that haven't, GDAL OGR are uh, data reading and transformation libraries, which take spatial data and convert from one format to another, and can do various spatial operations like filtering and the rest. They've also got their own Python bindings. Unfortunately, the Python bindings for GDAL and OGR are pretty straight, simple C Python bindings. They're not very for forgiving, so things like if this data set didn't exist, and I tried to do this in GDAL OGR, this would, and tried to open it, I should say, this wouldn't raise an error. Typically, I'd expect when I'm trying to open a file that doesn't exist, a Python IO error. GDAL doesn't do that. It just returns none. So your, your program will keep going with this none object, your none data set, until you try and do something a bit more interesting, and then it will fail. So there's a lot of issues there. It's also quite difficult to get access to your data. They've improved remarkably 
in the past few years. It used to be even longer and more complex than it is in this code sample at the bottom here to get vector data out of OGR. But it's still not very nice. Fiona is a drop-in replacement for OGR. It makes a couple of assumptions. Uh, the first main one being that you have a consistent schema. So o Fiona, unlike OGR, will only work on things like shape files or map info tab files, which have a consistent table. For the most part, this is fine. Um, but for other times, when you're trying to read something like a GeoJSON file or you know, various others, various um, point files, point data sets, this can be a problem. Um, happily, GeoJSON is a JSON file, which I'll show you in a sec, which you can just read in Python anyway. And one of the stated goals of Fiona is that if you're connecting to a database, you shouldn't be using Fiona. There are other, better Python tools to do that. So one of the things, has anyone here heard, seen GeoJSON before? Yes, everyone? Okay, this has pretty much become standard now for transferring spatial data across the web, at least for things like basic web mapping and passing data around. It's pretty obvious, it's a JSON object. So a JSON object with a geometry parameter which within that geometry parameter has the type of geometry, which is point, line, polygon, the rest, as well as the coordinates, and a properties parameter, which has all the actual attributes on your feature. This is really easy to work with because in Python, this is represented as a dictionary object. Everyone can get data in and out using Fiona like that. And it's very easy in Fiona to just open your spatial data, loop through, access all your data as a dictionary, and pull out everything that you need. So, Say I've got a shapefile that contains a bunch of tweets, and I open that shapefile in Fiona. I can read in those tweets really easily, and if I wanted to, I could produce a map out the other end. So, if I'm just looking around the Brisbane Convention Center, I really only care about features that are pretty close by. Fiona also offers a lot of options for filtering your data. Um, this is just one way to do it. Um, so filtering your data is really important because really after a while, there's only going to be a subset of data that you're interested in. If I have tens of thousands of tweets available, I don't, but if I did, then I'd only really care about tweets in a specific area for this job. Okay. The other thing I'm going to do, because I want to cluster my data, is I'm going to use the standard SciPy clustering tools, um, which means that all I want is a NumPy array of the coordinates. And that's actually really easy to get because I know that this data is a point data set, so I can simply loop through then because it's a dictionary, I can really easily grab out the coordinates and drop them into a NumPy array. As I said, if I'm gonna build a set of clusters, um, this is probably a bit by the way, but it's really easy. There's a lot of tools available. Um, everyone's seen this conference. Um, a bunch of talks about scikit-learn, which has a lot of clustering available, and there's also the standard SciPy clustering libraries. Now, this is actually not too hard to do. This is pretty basic. A hierarchical clustering system is basically grouping things not into a set number of clusters, but instead by how far away from each other they are. So in this case, I care about clusters of points where the points are within 100 meters of each other. Really simple. Then, I'm gonna use Shapely. Now, Shapely, you may or may not know, is a vector uh, library for Python. Shapely allows you to manipulate vectors, create new vectors, so points, lines, polygons, multipoints, multipolygons, and it's really easy to use. It has an interface for NumPy arrays, and it also has an interface for GeoJSON entities. So you can simply read a geometry as a GeoJSON object, dump it out as a NumPy array, or the reverse, do any kind of operation on it that you want, and you know, it's a very simple, nicely Pythonic library. Um, here, we're just gonna very simply take our clustered arrays, and then we're going to put a convex hull around them. Now, a convex hull is basically a region that looks like that region on the top there, which is the uh, maximum region that is convex that can contain all the points from our data set. Um, and I'm gonna do that like so. I'm then gonna put a buffer around it to make it look a bit more pretty. Um, and you can see there, the last line, shapely geometry as multi-point coords, simply just taking a NumPy array, casting it to a shapely geometry type, then I'm building a convex hull object, 
then I'm buffering that convex hull object. Really simple, really Pythonic. And that way, I can end up with a lot of points and some convex hulls around them, which is nice, but probably doesn't tell us a whole lot by itself. There's no reference here. I don't know what I'm looking at. So we want to look at putting maybe a picture in the background or some imagery. And that's where Rasterio comes in. Rasterio is the equivalent of Fiona, but for raster data. So if you're looking at imagery of any kind, Rasterio is the place to go. It's a drop-in replacement for the GDAL library and allows you to really quickly and easily read in your data, filter your data by a, a given region, and get a NumPy array. Because it's continuous data, it's really easily re represented as a NumPy array. And again, GDAL itself is not very friendly. If you ever tried to use the GDAL Python bindings, again, it quickly breaks if you get the wrong path, uh, if you get any of the parameters wrong, and yeah, it's not a particularly nice library to use. So Rasterio, much easier, much more Pythonic. One quick warning for those that don't know, in GDAL and in Rasterio and in any Python spatial library, uh, raster bands are measured from band one because of the Landsat specification. So band one in a raster in Python is the same as band one in a Landsat raster, not zero. This is really just a quick aside, but it's a really important one to know because everything else everywhere is indexed on zero. This is indexed on one. But we now have a NumPy array. And I can do things like quickly plotting that array out with matplotlib im show. That's really easy to do. Everyone's done that before. And we get a nice little picture here. But again, having that there isn't particularly useful by itself. So in comes CardoPy. Now, has anyone used matplotlib base map before? One? Couple? OK. It's not very friendly. Um, it takes a lot of work to get a nice looking map in matplotlib base map. So the British uh, Office of Meteorology, or British, British Met Office, I should say, um, built Cartopy. It's been around, or well, they've had it in production since about 2012, but it's really only gone live in the last six to 12 months. It's available on GitHub. Um, it's a bit of a killer because it's actually not in the cheese shop. So if you want to get access to this, go to the GitHub repository, download it, oh, hell, um, <laughs> and install it yourself. Um, but Happily, every map in this presentation was made in Cartopy. It's actually really easy to use. It's really fast. So in Cartopy, as a quick aside, every object has a projection. Because we're concerned with spatial data, everything has to have a projection, including the canvas itself. And what this means is that Cartopy can reproject data on the fly. So if I have data in different projections, if, for example, my raster data, which is in um, a projection A, say UTM zone 56 south, which is what we're in. Um, and my tweets, for instance, are just lats and longs. Uh, so they're in simple WGS84 lat long. Then Cartopy, as long as it's told what projection the data is in and what projection the output frame is in, will do the reprojection on the fly on the map for you. That, and that, that makes the life a whole lot easier. And it's really easy to make a projection in Cartopy. Um, I won't explain now what an EPSG zone is. I'm not sure I've got much time left, but <laughs> we'll keep going <laughs> in, the <laughs> in the meantime. Cool. 10 minutes. Easy. So an EPSG um, number, ID, is really easy to build a projection in Cardify from. Uh, you can grab those online, spatialreference.org. Great. The other tip I really have here, and it's really important, is if you can possibly avoid it and you've got a raster image, don't try and reproject it. It's lossy and takes a long time and a lot of memory. If you've got vector data, it's really easy to reproject that because it's just a simple point-to-point -point reprojection. Rasters have, a, have that, but they also need to be interpolated. So if you can keep the raster in the original projection, your life is going to be a whole lot easier. Okay? Then, if I want to, it's simply a matter of setting the projection on the map, one line of code, adding some grid lines because I can, adding some data, so I'm going to add my image. And you can just see that this is straight matplotlib imagery. The only differences here are the transformation object, which is my um, Cartopy projection, and the extent for the images. So the extent is just the bound of the image because the image itself contains no better data about where it is in space. And then I can simply add that. And if I want to, Cartopy 
really simply supports adding Shapley geometries to the map. So if I have a stack of Shapley geometries because I've done some analysis and got some clusters, then I can really simply add those with the add geometries feature. Now I know having used Shapley for a while, it has been for a while a massive pain to plot Shapley geometries out. This makes it really easy because in those simple lines of code, I have that. And this is a map showing tweets in and around the Brisbane Convention Center with some clusters as convex hulls. The imagery in the background, I've got some grid lines on top. If I wanted to, I could start adding scale bars, I can add titles, and I can add labels. Um, and really, that's all there is to it. I mean, going from simply reading your basic data in using Fiona and Rasterio to plotting it on a nice looking map with CarterPy has actually become a whole lot easier in the last, say, six to 12 months than it has been previously. And that opens up, I think, the GIS Python library even further. So not only now can we actually do the analysis and do all the hard work, we can start to do things like automating map production. If, for example, you need to look at uh, all the weather data that we have that's coming in from the Bureau of Met, which is why CarterPy is there, and you need to do some calculations, and then you need to produce some maps up the other end, you don't want someone doing that manually. This makes it easy because you can go through and do it consistently in every time in the same way, set up these parameters, and I think this looks all right. It's not great, but you know, for 12 lines of code, it's pretty good. And really, that's all there is to it. So, um, sorry? Um, no? Sorry, I'll put it back up. Haha. -ha. Everyone loves a toucan. Toucans are cool. Uh, no, these aren't just tweets about the conference. These are just tweets in general. I'll show you just in my IPython notebook in a sec how I can get tweets out. Um, this is just tweets in general. And these were only the tweets until I sort of did this slide at about, I don't know, midnight on Friday. So if I want to look at a bit more data, I will jump across to my uh, IPython notebook. And you can see all the code that's hopefully. OK, can everyone see this? Wait, good, great. All right, you can see all the code that's involved. Import some libraries. Just set up some standard projection stuff. So um, basically, if I'm interested in knowing what projections are and I want to know where things are, for example, the Brisbane Convention Center, I've got the position of that in latitude and longitude. It's really easy to take that point, project it in space, and get an answer out the other side. Um, I'll just quickly, oh, jeez, looking way ahead, sorry. Uh, uh, the, the devils are doing live demo. Uh, I should know better than this. So if I import that, do that, do that, set up some things. Okay, here I can really simply uh, set up my in rings. Okay, here is my simple reading of my points into an umpire array. I already showed you this. So this is just simply opening a shapefile, and that's all the code that there needs to be in Fiona. Great. Um, this is just making a cluster, doing that. These are all my clusters at the other end. So you can see the numbers there. Rasterio. Now, you'll notice there's a bit more code here because the actual image I've got is huge um, and at quite a fine resolution. Part of the reason that I want to cut it down so much is um, that my computer will quickly run out of memory. Um, so you'll notice here that I'm doing a couple of calculations with source.define. And the source.define is just a quick matrix transformation to transform from column references to projected references, and the tilde source sort of fine does the reverse. Okay, so that just reads in my chunk of data that I care about. Okay, and this is basically all the code there is to making a map. Now you'll notice there's a bunch of lines commented out here. I don't need those at all. It's just these are some features that I was using when I was making my slides to add a coastline, to add uh, land polygons, to block out things, to add uh, state boundaries and the rest of it's actually really easy to do. Cartify offers a lot of these. And I can just do this on the fly. Da, 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 da. And hopefully, assuming that this doesn't break on me. Yes, really. Okay, so here we have a lot more tweets. Um, shockingly, this was done yesterday, last night, um, which is great. But we still don't really know who's tweeting about the PyCon stuff. So, if I was curious, and that's the kind of person that I am, I've actually taken from these tweets um, the number of 
um, people that mention PyCon in the name. I can do a quick bit of spatial analysis using PySAL, which I'll leave <coughs> off for now because um, you probably don't care. So that, again, is drawing a map. There we go. So here we can see highly spatially dependent tweets. Hmm, that's suspicious. Um, and if I wanted to just check that against the actual number of tweets, there you go. There's all the tweets about PyCon. And that's me done. Any questions? Or the rest? How much time I've got? <laughs>